Hello, this is Anna Imagination, and I want to put the scope today right on when you're on the verge of making a conclusion. This is a feeling that it's subtle, but it's it's not subtle. It, it's actually quite an obtuse feeling. But if you're not aware of it, if you don't know to catch it, you it can pass you by and it will take you, it could take you a while to figure it out. And then when you finally figure it out, it's a, oh, that's what's going on. And I've learned that if you just pause life and set back and give your mind what it wants, that's what we're talking about, giving your mind what it wants, that you really stumble right into whatever you need. And I do this a million times a day. It's actually been, I've had about four or five days of low key, quiet rest. And then today it's like, my brain won't stop. And it's like, I got to record this. I got to record this. So I've recorded probably like 10 classes today. I've written three articles and I I've, it's one of those things with me where I've learned that that's my productivity. That's my productivity wave. I want to talk about the productivity wave, finding your natural productivity wave, because this is really, really imperative to knowing who you are and your natural productivity wave is literally your pattern and your rotation and for me my instinct is going there's three points but I'm going no I'm pretty sure there's only two but that's I, I I'm pretty sure there's three there's three I've only been able to identify two so the productivity wave is basically my quiet contemplation point. And this is where I rest and I just observe and I think. And then it's that high discovery center. I, I got to talk. I've got to think. I've got to take the stage. And that's where I throw myself on stage and I analyze. And that's where I really bounce myself. But that I, if I were to put a third one on it, it would be the overwhelming confusion point. It's that point where I really need to go back to contemplation. And really what this paints is that ABC formula. My ABC formula is adventure, boundary up, and then comfort zone. And when you're in the comfort zone, you indulge and then you go back to the adventure zone. But the boundary is where you get confused. You're not sure where you are. You might feel like, I don't know what's going on here. And then you fall back to the comfort zone. So I've been about five days in the comfort zone. I have never been in the comfort zone that long. One day I slept 16 hours after having a three hour nap. And then after I slept for 16 hours after my three hour nap, I woke up and I had another three hour nap. That was after I completed my Tratic Healing course, after I had bulldozed through building my company for a year and a half, and I went, it is done. Fall down now and just sleep. So I slept for 16 hours plus six. And then I entered a state of just sit back, silent, observe. Prior to that point, I was not sure what was going on. I'm like, okay, I'm confused. Is my business having problems? And my business didn't look like it was having problems. It felt like I had sailed my ship into a bunch of fog. And I was going, wait a minute, did I run my ship aground? No. Is my ship sinking? No. Is this a smoke and mirror show? Did my ship even lose, leave port? And I just had a delusion that it didn't know. What is this? And I couldn't figure it out. So I'm huge on take a knee, step back, evaluate. So I did for five days. And then I had an epiphany last night of, oh, I leveled up. The business was fine. I leveled up. So when you do a business, it's your business goes here and then you go here. And then when you go here, it's like you're dragging the chain and then it goes whoop. And then when the business grows, it pulls you up. So you get this thing where it's literally like you're doing this with your business. It's you versus the employer, the, the CEO. So you're doing this. And the more the business grows, the more the business pushes you up. And the more you get pushed up by the business, the more you pull the company up. And you end up moving and steering with each other. It's a very symbiotic, sentient relationship. And then I had this massive epiphany of, oh, this is where I'm at. This is my new business. This I understand. I had a massive of just a flood of epiphany 
So this morning I spent all this time completely breaking down. I didn't say I broke it down. I would say I refined it. I would say I've been honing rough diamond, raw rough diamond from, from scratch, from raw diamond. And I finally chipped away that first facet and now I'm getting ready to polish and do more facets. So now I'm getting like an actual cut diamond. That's where I'm at. And then I'm right back to, I have all this stuff to say, and this is my rotation. Everybody has a productivity wave like this, every single person. Finding yours is imperative to understanding your routine, your pattern, and what you need to do. And it's very much your ABC. You're going to have an ABC. It's going to be the thing you do when you are at the Discovery Center, when you're adventuring. What is your adventuring? And when you reach your boundary, it's going to be a point of confusion. It's going to be a point of, I got to take a knee. I just, I don't understand. And what that is, is you've lost perspective. You've either been in one particular perspective for too long that you can't see the other perspectives. Take a knee, step back, take a knee. The boundary is always step back, take a knee, get back in your comfort zone. Now, what you do in your comfort zone and what you do in your adventure zone is unique to you. My adventure zone is writing articles and recording these videos. That's mine. That might not be yours. Yours might be writing books. Yours might be doing marketing. Yours might be drawing pictures. It's your productivity. That's what it is. It's when you are the most productive. Now, your comfort zone is when you are shut down and you are absolutely your least productive. That's what that is. You know, it's funny because I'm looking at my my team right now and we were on sabbatical. I literally, five days ago when I, when I couldn't figure out what was going on, I'm like, is it the business? Is it me? We're shutting everything down. Everyone go on vacation. And I literally like slammed the brakes on my business and I had everyone, yes, I do this. I immediately call a massive break and I send everybody home and I'm like, we're all going to just take a step back and we're all going to take a deep breath and just reset. Massive productivity boost afterwards because you come back to it and you are so refreshed. Highly recommend it. And we came back, we're, we're coming back and the productivity is through the roof. We're all feeling refreshed and it's this massive reset of just Wow, it's it's just such a wonderful experience. And it cleared so much. But finding your productivity and then finding how you do sabbatical is really the key to your refreshment. And I, I'm going to call it refreshment. I love the word refreshment. Let's just look at the psychology of the word refreshment. I heard the word refreshment whenever I was in church or whenever I was in school, or whenever I was at a PTA meeting, and they would say, we have refreshments. And I'm like, oh, refreshments, because it was always the same thing. It was cookies and Kool-Aid, and that's all I gave a shit about, cookies and Kool-Aid. And I don't know why, but cookies and Kool-Aid was like the best fucking thing in the world. And they weren't just any cookies. They were a very special kind of like ringlet cookies that I could only get there. I have never been able to find them anywhere else. They are only at one store that I know of in that shit town I grew up in. And they are not worth going back to that shit town for. But good God, I could Google them. Maybe the internet has them. The internet did not exist when I last had these cookies. So it did not occur to me. I could just Google these cookies. And we had them at VBS, Vocational Bible School. We'd be, I went to VBS just for those cookies, just for the refreshment. After, after church, they'd be like, we're having refreshments in the gymnasium. So I have these refreshments stuck in my head. And now to this day, when I hear the word refreshments, I go, it's nostalgic for me. So for me, refreshments. There needs to be refreshments in my business. I'm going to have refreshments. It's going to have refreshments. It's like my favorite word in the world. And, and it has to be red Kool-Aid. And it has to be yeah, cherry Kool-Aid. And it has to be cookies. It's mandatory. Refreshments. So what do you do for your refreshments? And it's, it's really a sit down, step back, take a look at it and resetting yourself. And it, if you can't recognize this part of yourself, what are you doing? Really, if you cannot recognize this part of yourself, it's going to be harder for you to really apply it, to recognize it. We're, we're, we really got to talk about 
getting cozy with yourself. We need you to get intimate with you. Self-intimacy. Oh, that's a thing. Self-intimacy. That's going to be the name of this video. Self-intimacy. Self-intimacy is a whole nother level of self-care. It's a whole nother level of consciousness. I, I can't explain this to you enough. And there's people who, I don't even know who I am. What do you want to be? I don't know. Well, what's your name? I don't know. I just know I hate my name or my name is not right for me. Well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know who I am. And those people are so far gone with their identity. And it's common. A lot of people are that way. And when you find yourself, self-intimacy is on the other side of the spectrum. So, and it's probably why I haven't really gotten into it is because it's let's get you from not knowing who you are to, hi, this is everybody on your team. You've got seven people inside of you. They all have a purpose and agenda. Familiarize yourself with your inner team. And then it's learning how to work together with your team. After you've learned how to work together with your team, you slide all over into this area where you start to have arguments with your team. And then you learn how to get along with each other so well that you just, you do everything that identity wants. Then that's all there is to it because identity's in charge. And that's all you do. Identity wants, therefore you do. And, and there is nothing else. And then you pat yourself on the back and you're really happy for who and what you are. But then there's like this whole other thing of self-intimacy. Self-intimacy is, I would say I reached self-intimacy at the 20th, 22nd level of consciousness in. We're talking deep intimacy. I would say self-intimacy occurs at the 20th to 22nd level of consciousness. We are talking so deeply intimate with yourself that you know when you know your child so well that you just answer the phone and they say hi and you go, what's wrong? It's that, but it's with yourself. And you don't have to ask what's wrong. You know what's wrong. It is such a status of honesty with yourself. So that's where you're at when you're at reaching the point of epiphany. And it's very, very focused. It's like your subconscious mind is pulling you over here going, no, I need your attention over here, please. This is what's going on in my brain right now is it's going, I need your attention over here, please. And I'm going, okay, all right, all right. What, what do you need? And my daughter's made these awesome little pizza things that I'm waiting for to cool. And she's going, mom, I need your help. And I'm going, right. And it's very hard to exit the subconscious mind while I go help her with the oven. I get back here and the subconscious mind is going, no, I need you here right now, right now. And I'm going, okay, subconscious mind, what is it? And when your subconscious mind is drawing that level of attention to you, when you're self-intimate, you notice, you hear it, you listen, you do. And I, I literally have to treat my subconscious mind equal to my children, literally equal to my children, where it's like, okay, so, sorry, my, my subconscious mind is, is calling me. Let, let's take care of you. And then I will take care of my subconscious mind. Now I'm going to go take care of my subconscious mind. I have to do this. And this is literally equal to what it's like managing yourself is when your subconscious mind, when you become so self-intimate that your internal mind, your internal world just commands and draws in your attention. So I'm, I'm at the end of this. I, I've done the classes. I've done the, the try to killing part two is done. And I've done these mini courses after and we're, we're wrapping things up as far as packaging goes. And I've been networking, bringing in people. It's been wonderful. And then we had this massive sabbatical. And it's been this massive step back of, all right, let's sit down. Let's evaluate everything. Let me go get refreshments. And There's, there's the concept of their calm before the storm, but I suddenly had a slew of just wanting to regurgitate all these concepts. And I refer to it as theoretical discussion. I love theoretical discussion. 
And theoretical discussion is when you want to just talk about random shit that has absolutely no belonging anywhere. It's just, let, let's talk about this. Let's just zoom right in on this topic. And when you do theoretical discussion, when you talk about theoretical discussion, what you are delving into is very much this world of understanding that something is wrong with the way we practice it. It's it's something is wrong with the way we think about it. And this is this is it right here is there is a process of evaluation. So so this is how I like to do it. All right. I, everyone comfortable? We're in our meeting now. Great. So the reason why we're having this business corporate meeting world, and that's what it is. It's the world's corporate meeting. Hi world. This is our business corporate meeting. And this is basically, you know, it is it is the second level of the third of the they of I, and we're coming together to discuss all of the problems that have been brought by our HR services. So we got a list the other day from our HR department of the world, and we're going to do this. It's the world's HR department. Yep, that's it. That's it. I represent the world's HR department. And we are talking about, I speak for myself, and we are talking about all the complaints that have been received by the world's HR department. And one of the biggest things that we've noticed is no one is really fucking happy at all with the way things are being run around here. And uh, we could talk about all the problems and the bullshit and whose fault that is. That's that's really common right now, but we've got social media doing that. So we're not going to do that because social media has that handled. That's our complaint department. We're going to assign social media as the complaint department. That's what we've done. Social media is the complaint department. Now, this is the get shit done solutions department. That's what we are. We are the world solutions department. Yep, that's right. And if you have a complaint, you can take it to our social media platform. This is the world solutions department. That's what we are, world solutions. And in order to figure out what is wrong with the world today and resolve it, we have to talk about it. But it's really important that this is productive communication as opposed to social media. It's really, really important that this is productive because we're solutionists over here. So one of the biggest problems we've noticed is the economy. That's a big problem that we're noticing a lot of. And we've also noticed that there's a really big problem with mental health. That one is undeniable. And then the other problem that we've noticed is the educational everything. So these are the three core problems we've noticed. Now, we also are aware of the environmental issues, but I am a firm believer, and I think we will all agree with the board, there's a board now, that environmentalists are really a consequence. That once we address the mental health, the education, and the economy, the environment is going to literally just kind of fix itself. And the reason why I say that is because the environment is literally fourth generation chain reaction from a bigger catalyst. And if we talk about the environment, it's like, imagine, imagine you live in Australia and there is a garbage can with an ibis. If you don't know, an ibis is a bird that lives in Australia that's always eating out of the garbage cans. And... The ibis knocked down the garbage and a whole lot of people, the environmentalists are all about cleaning up the garbage and we'll clean up the garbage. But while we're trying to clean up the garbage, the ibis is poking us, but we're going to ignore the ibis and just focus on the garbage. Now we clean up the garbage. We put it in the bin. And as soon as we get it in the bin, the ibis throws it out and we ignore the ibis. We just keep picking up the garbage and putting it in the bin and the ibis pokes us. We ignore the ibis and we pick up the garbage and we put it back in the bin and then the ibis kicks the bin over and pokes us. We ignore the ibis and we pick up the garbage. You see where this is going? This is not a solution. So if you really want to address the environmental issue, you need to address the ibis problem. The ibis problem, and I'm looking at this, 
falls back to the mental health problem. But I think I'm certain mental health is a symptom of, well, as I discussed today and realized that economy is directly linked to mental health. So I'm going to say that mental health is a third generation consequence problem and that it's not actually the cause. That's a lot like, again, the garbage. Okay, so we're going to instead go over to the food area and we're going to try cleaning up all the food that's all over the place that people have not bothered to put in the bin. But when we go to do that, there are seagulls now with the ibis and they're fighting over who gets the leftover french fries and we are ignoring the birds. We are just going to pick up the garbage and put it in the bin. But when we do that, the ibis kicks over the bin again. So there's the mental health problem. So as we're cleaning up the mental health problem, we realize that the real catalyst of the mental health is the economy. So we're going, ah, oh, it's the economy. So that would be our second generational problem of, oh, well, if we fix the economy, we'll fix the mental health. We fix the mental health and the environmental will stop being a problem. But what's causing the economy to be a problem? Now, that's interesting. Now, what's really interesting of this whole thing is when you look at the environmental fourth generational problem and the mental health third generational problem and the economy's second generational problem, all of these three things have one thing really in common, and that is <clears throat> our educational department. So now I'm looking at the educational department going, interesting, interesting. Now, here's a solution. If we correct the educational problem, then it's what I like to call a waterfall effect, is you then waterfall effect the education and then the economy fixes itself, which then fixes the mental health problem, which then fixes the environment and boof, we're all done because all we had to do was fix the educational problem. Oh, look at that. I have Alexandria. See how this works? So it's really an understanding of the catalyst and addressing the right catalyst. If you don't address the right catalyst, this is why you need math. This is why you need math. If you know which is the right catalyst, then you can address the right catalyst. Environmentalists do not know what the right catalyst because they did not study math. And as a result, they don't understand that what they're dealing with is a symptom to a bigger problem because they're not dealing with the catalyst. And when you're addressing mental health problems, again, we're looking at the same problem of they haven't studied math. So as a result, they're not addressing their catalysts. They're addressing a whole lot of amputees with Band-Aids. And when you've got a lot of bleeding out, Band-Aids aren't gonna help you. And you really gotta go back to the catalyst. Now, the funny thing in mathematics, is when you are looking at somebody, if you're looking at a whole chain reaction, you have your catalyst, and then you've got your chain reaction that trickles off of your catalyst. Now, this is where a lot of people think they have found a catalyst, and this is really where it's a problem, is in order to do this, you have to span out and look at a massive amount of perspective and go, oh, I understand where the catalyst is coming from. But unfortunately, most catalysts are invisible. Most catalysts are invisible. Now we have a gorgeous little catch-22 here that is not appealing at all. And the catch-22 is people are not mentally healthy enough to learn. So now you've got mentally unhealthy people trying to learn, not learning so the education is not working. So then more people are not learning. They're more mentally ill. So the education is declining. And now we got the spiral down and it's just like spiraling out of control. So it's a matter of locating the right entry point of the education and then diverting it where it needs to go, putting in the right plug-in and then boop, it all trickles down and you're fine. You've interrupted the catch-22. And once you get that spiral going up, it's an entirely different ball game. But the thing is with catalysts is most people, when they find the catalyst, what they really have found is the first visible chain reaction or the first visible generation of a chain reaction. So what we think is the catalyst is not the catalyst, it's actually the first offset of a chain reaction. It's like really morbid example, but I've been watching numbers, so bear with me. It's like when somebody, a, a serial killer commits murders 
and they're looking for the chain reaction because the first murder can tell them a lot about who is the one who's doing this. So they'll locate all the common denominators and then they'll trail it down to the first victim. But in every single case, there is their very first victim, which is so random and unusual and sloppy that trial and error, the serial killer has learned from the trial and error and then change the behavior. And what ends up resulting is a whole lot of new serial killings that are unlinked to the first one because the first one is so absolutely a unique fingerprint that it's unrelated, it looks like it's unrelated. And as a result, when you're looking for the catalyst, a lot of people find the first murder and they're going, well, that's the catalyst, but it's never the catalyst. That's the first visible generation of chain reactions. The catalyst is always before the first visible. The catalyst is always invisible. That's a law. That needs to be a law somewhere. The catalyst is always invisible. For instance, pulling off of the show numbers, they use a sprinkler a lot actually to explain chain reactions, cause, effect, catalyst, and they use a sprinkler. So the sprinkler comes out of the ground, shoots off the water, and the consequence is the generations of drops that go from point A to point B. And the further away from the sprinkler, the rain falls, tells you the trajectory. You can find the line of path. You can trail it back to the point of origin, which is the sprinkler. So people think, oh, the sprinkler is the catalyst. Nope. The sprinkler is the timer on the sprinkler. That's the catalyst. The catalyst is what sets it off. The catalyst is the human being going, oh, my grass is dry. That's the catalyst. And so the homeowner, the drought is actually the catalyst because the drought is what causes the homeowner to go, ooh, I need to install a sprinkler system. And then the homeowner installs the sprinkler system. The homeowner digs up their yard and plants the water system. And then a year later, the grass has grown over and now you've got an underground sprinkler system. Now you've got a timer that goes off. And when that water sprinkler shoots out of the ground and then fires off the water, people think, oh, the sprinkler is the catalyst. No, the drought from a year ago was the catalyst. The catalyst is always invisible. So when you are looking to do world solutions or any kind of a problem, it's vital that you locate the right catalyst so you know exactly where you need to enter the waterfall effect. It's literally the plug-in that's going to set off very much this chain reaction to fix everything. So this is World Solutions Department and the world's HR has filed many complaints with the social media department. So it's it's really a, I don't know, I'm all over the place lately. I'm really all over the place right now. But it's, it's I don't know, I'm following my gut, I'm following my whim and it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm good. My, my subconscious mind is like, you gotta record. And I'm like, all right, I'm here and I'm recording. And when I'm done with my whim telling me what I need to record, then I will be done. So I think for now, I'm just going to do the whole world solutions department. Yeah, and I, I like that. I actually like that a lot. We are with the world solutions department. We get a lot of complaints from the social media world. So this might be a new thing. Thank you so much. And may the kindest of words always find you.